Um, anyone who is on this webinar can go back and re-listen, um, and or folks who weren't able to join us can go to our website and hear the presentation. Um, so today we are talking about school staff wellness as an intervention for ensuring trauma-informed schools for healing. Um, this is such a relevant and important topic, and we're really glad to be spending time on it today. Some quick housekeeping. Um, uh, presumably you all hear me, and if you can't hear me, then <laughs> telling you won't help, but there is a call-in number. Um, you are automatically muted when you call in. Um, however, there's a, both a chat and a Q&A um, section of WebEx. If you don't see them, there are circles at the bottom of your screen. Um, the chat looks like a little talking bubble. So if you click one of those, you're welcome to type in um, questions or thoughts. Um, if you send them to either the full group or to me, um, I will be able to present them back to Kelly by the end when we have some time for Q&A. Or if you're having technological difficulties, please let me know and I can help you figure that out. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the webinar is being recorded so that other um, people can learn from it, and we will share both the recording and any supporting materials via email afterwards. So thank you again for joining us today. Um, if you don't know us, the California School-Based Health Alliance is a statewide nonprofit that works to um, improve the health and academic success of children and youth by advancing health services in schools. We do this in a lot of different ways. We are a small but mighty team of 10 staff, um, mostly based out of Oakland, also Central Valley, and reaching into the Inland Empire, but we serve the entire state. Um, we help schools, dist school districts and schools and um, community partners to launch school-based health centers as well as school, other school programming, school health programming, and we um, help improve the services that currently exist through um, sustainability planning and technical assistance and training on topics as requested. We have all kinds of toolkits on our website, um, and we do lots of different trainings in person and online like the one today. Um, and we definitely want to hear from you all what your deepest needs are so that we can help support them. So definitely reach out to us um, if you have specific training topics you want to see or other needs. Um, one of the uh, lovely ways that we bring the field together and provide a lot of training and technical assistance is through our annual conference. This year it's in Sacramento. It's on Thursday, May 14th and Friday, May 15th. Um, we're really excited about this year. There will be a lot of focus this year on school staff wellness um, because it's coming up so much. Also a lot of focus on trauma screens and interventions, um, on substance use prevention and treatment, um, uh, there is an opportunity for some hands-on self-care practice on Friday morning, um, as well as a reception at Cafeteria 15L on Thursday evening. Um, so we really encourage um, you all to attend if you can. We did sell out last year, so if you're hoping to attend, buy your tickets soon. Um, and if you buy them before March 31st, you get an early bird registration discount. Also, if you're a member of CSHA, you also get discounts for your full staff. which I think just leads us to the content. Um, I really want to appreciate Kelly Kanochi for joining us today. Um, this topic about staff wellness and what it means to have a trauma-informed school is one of the conversations that we are having most often with our school and community partners. Um, the idea of wellness and healing and trauma-informed care is not just about the students and the patients that we work with, but also with the school staff that we work with, um, because we know that school staff that are traumatized and not able to take care of themselves can't serve the students and young people that they want to. Um, so um, we are really excited about the work that the Teaching Well is doing and really excited to bring it to you today. Um, I also want to say that this uh, workshop is part of a longer series of supporting adolescent health care and well-being, um, and we want to give a really big shout out to Anthem for supporting this series. Um, there are three more workshops coming up, so please check out our website and participate in all of them, and um, thank you to Anthem um, for supporting them and making them possible. Um, Kelly, I'm going to have you take it away from here and tell us um, what what we can learn from you today. I'm passing you the facilitation. 
Awesome. Thank you so much, Amy, for the wonderful introduction. Hello, everybody um, across the interwebs. My name is Kelly Kanoki. I'm the executive director and founder of The Teaching Well. Um, and before I started The Teaching Well, I was a sixth grade math and science teacher in Oakland and saw many initiatives coming through Oakland to support our students, both at an academic um, and social emotional level. And the thing I was unprepared for as I stepped into my first few years of teaching was how many adults left campus each year. So at my school site, we lost a third of our staff every year. And in Oakland, in our areas with our most marginalized communities, um, we are seeing 70% of staff leave within five years. Um, and so this training comes from just being on the ground and knowing that in order to, um, for our teachers to be able to stay and um, not just teachers, but service and social health providers, um, we needed to have some time facilitated in staff environments to care for ourselves. So that is what we're going to be talking about today. Um, I am now have access to changing the agenda. So if we look over the agenda, here's what we'll explore. Um, I first wanna say that I wanna define educator broadly. So this is not just people who are instructionally working with students, but we see this as all student facing staff on school sites. Um, and so if you are not a teacher or not an administrator, but you are a school nurse or you're a school psychologist or an interventionist, perhaps that you actually work in the school health center. Um, we see you as an educator because you are making the connection to learning for our students, um, whether it's learning about their bodies or learning about math. Um, and so I wanna preface that first, because I'll use that term throughout the course of the hour. And I wanna make sure you include yourself in it. Um, throughout the session today, there's going to be some time where you're going to get to do your own personal reflection. So if you have the opportunity to have a pen or a pencil nearby with a sheet of paper so that you can take notes or write down questions or reflect on your own personal practice, I really invite you to have those tools that you need at the ready. Um, and I also encourage you to write down questions into the chat box or in the Q&A right when they come up for you. Amy is going to be collecting this together and we are going to make sure that the end of our session, roughly seven to um, five minutes, we'll make sure to answer those questions. Um, and to be respectful of your time, I'm going to be packing a lot in. And so I look forward to both getting your feedback and um, and making sure that there is a lot of content so that you feel like your time has been used valuably today. The one other piece that I want to add before I go over the agenda is just that I know that I'm talking on this webinar to people who are experts, um, experts in their community, experts in their specific niche of school health um, based work. And so what I hope to provide to you today is a different lens of looking at tools and facts and understandings that you already have. Um, and I also provide you the opportunity to really be open. Um, and we call this a beginner staff stance in our work. Um, so that means if you hear something new, that you receive it for the first time and you get to just be with what, um, what comes up for you around that. And if it feels good and it feels connected to your relevant experience, take it on and use it in your life. If it doesn't work, feel free to leave it and let it go. Um, set similarly, if you hear something that you've heard before, we invite you to take a beginner stance and um, consider how, does this, how is this relevant in a unique way in the present moment today or from the lens of adult care um, rather than student or client care. And yeah. That's really the two parts. Okay, so over the course of this next 45 minutes, the first thing that we're really going to talk about that I think is the unique work that the teaching will provide is sharing our underlying beliefs of what we think of the education system, what we think about the health um, healthcare system when it comes to schools, and how that um, lives out inside how we serve schools. And then we'll take a portion of the time to just share how we live those beliefs out and the tools that we offer both individual teachers, school sites, and districts to be able to start having the conversation around staff wellness. Um, 
and we'll close very briefly with how we've what the results that we've seen by with the sites and districts we've worked at and other leaders in the field who are helping this transformation occur. Right. So the first thing that we would say at the teaching well is that healthy people heal systems. Um, so this visual might look like Maslow's hierarchy of needs and it is the teaching well theory of action. So we all know and all come into this work because we wanna create thriving school communities at that top part of the pyramid. And we would say, especially when I started the organization five years ago, that 99% of the professional development that educators receive is how to do the work well. So how to make the integrated project, how to build the curriculum, how to provide services to your client or to a student, um, and about how do a colleagues and adults collaborate to do the work together. And if you've ever been on a school site, um, you know that there's a lot going on underneath the surface of whether or not that collaboration and that action can happen and be of service to students. So we imagine that this, Maslow, this pyramid turns into an iceberg and that the top two parts are above the surface of what we think is needed um, for a system and to thrive and serve our clients and students, but that the foundation of how those things work is at the base healthy people. So each educator or each service provider being able to acknowledge their stress signals, be responsive to those, those signals, and manage their energy levels, not just through a day, a week, or a year, but a career in the work. Then from that healthy, healthy stance, their ability to communicate their needs to other adults on campus or other adults in the serve in the center, um, the health based center, using having trust, asking for support, having agency and boundaries, that those two pieces working in tandem together, so healthy people and healthy relationships, is the foundation of whether or not we can use our knowledge and our how to do things to our clients or students to create that thriving school community. Um, and so we believe that healthy adults are at the base of creating transformational school environments. And we also believe that healthy systems heal people. And so this is a visual from Broth and Brenner. It's the ecological framework for human development. And as a child psychologist, Graf and Brenner was really talking about how a child is not just developed by their own nature, their own personality, but actually are um, impressed, impressed upon by their interpersonal relationships, by the organization that hold them and the community and the policy that comes and creates an impact on how a student, how a child is able to develop. And so we take this model and we start considering the care provider. So just as we said that a healthy individual is the foundation for creating that thriving school community, we also deeply believe that the policies, the community, and how the organization holds its, um, its colleagues, peers, adults, employees, is going to have an impact on how that individual is able to care for themselves and able to serve the client or the student. Um, and so we really see healthy people heal systems and healthy systems heal people and that they can't go, you can't just have one without the other. Um, if I think a huge part or a huge criticism of the educator self-care movement or the service self-care movement is this idea that it's um, creating compliance or it's, uh, it's putting the onus on the individual for a systemic issue. And so we really just want to be conscious of that and acknowledge that it is a both and, so it's this idea of self-care and communal care at the same time. How, as an individual, am I advocating for my needs and caring for myself? And how does my community have um, literacy and knowledge that all of our individual care matters? And how do we have the tools and systems in place to be able to support care as it arises in the moment um, as we interact and serve our students and our clients? And as I shared earlier about my own story in the classroom and seeing so many brilliant colleagues leave, 
I just really want to land that this there is an epidemic of care provider stress. And um, this care provider stress is not only causing attrition, which is the a financial bottom line that's problematic for schools and systems, but it is also has an impact on the the health and community care. So when we're thinking about working in our communities that have um, that are being impacted by policies that don't care for them um, or having a marginalized identity that doesn't feel safe within the larger, broader system as it currently is, having safe, consistent, caring adults um, who are there and who are present, who build relationship beyond difference is a key ingredient for that student or that client to be able to find healing within the system. Um, and so when we are having attrition happen at service provider levels, whether that's in social work, whether that's in teaching, whether that's in nursing, and that those individuals leave, we're now asking the client, the student, to reset and rebuild relationship to be able to access healing and access services. Um, and this is compounded with the fact that when educators are stressed and social workers and care providers are stressed, we are more likely to act on implicit biases. We're more likely to um, subconsciously make racist decisions or to respond rather than restoratively to respond punitively to, um, to our students or clients. And that ends up leading to us perpetuating systems of harm, right? And so when we're talking about teacher um, as service provider care, we're not just talking about ensuring that the health and physical well-being um, and emotional well-being of adults is cared for in the system. We're actually talking about creating a transformational system that goes beyond um, that goes beyond continuing the status quo, which we know is not working for so many of our youth. Um, and I think I share all of this with you, and I'll share a couple more beliefs in a second, because I think that this story, telling the new story of why care matters for adults and why caring for each other is integral to student outcomes or client outcomes, allows us a new way of talking about how we can care for ourselves and creating a healthy and thriving ecosystem for all people. So. You may have heard these beliefs, but I just want to lay them out and you can read them on the slide. We first and foremost believe in the brilliance and capacities of educators and all people that are on the front lines of this work. We believe that they have the, in, the intuitive knowledge, they have the connectedness with their client or student, and that they have the values that drive that drove them to serve in this community and that that is what we get to nurture and grow so that they have the skill set to do that work for a long time and do it effectively. Two, we deeply honor um, people edu who give educators tools and instructional skills to do the act of teaching or do the act of service. We believe educators and teachers need more support on how to be while facilitating learning. So we, you know, and I'm coming from the educator perspective here, there are many tools out here that are increasing technology and access to learn math or to learn English or to, um, you know, assess a student. But how we are with our students and clients is actually the, the impact that is felt by the student and is where the transformation and engagement occurs. Um, and so, we support all of that work and we think it should be a majority of the ways that we are um, taught to be professionals, but without the tools on how to be in the work and how to care for ourselves so we can maintain a healthy way of being with other people in the care providing industry, uh, we're missing out on being successful. And three, we know that there is a need for transformation within our education system and within our healthcare system for that matter and social services. And we believe that that transformation lies within the adults that are already within the system who have chosen this work and why, and how can we change the way we are together and how can we create new systems to allow um, our students and clients to succeed. We believe that if each adult was able to understand their identity to understand 
their racial, socioeconomic, um, able, gender, sexual orientation, their identity, and how it impacts how they serve um, and how it interacts with their clients' um, identities. We, um, one, two, that they'd be able to communicate their needs and um, respond to stressors, and three, that they can manage the response to stress and vicarious trauma, that they would be able to create effective trauma-informed environments for all students and all clients. And that if we're missing one of those pieces, the ability to communicate, the ability to understand who you are and how that, how that plays out in the context of your environment and how you manage your stress and vicarious trauma, that we are not able to create that effectively trauma-informed environment, even if we have all of the how-tos of how we should do it to a student. So how the teaching world lives out our beliefs. Um, first and foremost, we only offer trainings during contracted work hours or for free for educators and service providers. So the systems are the ones who uh, partner with us to bring us to a program. We um, only, we ask educators to practice on themselves first. And in whenever you're in a training with the Teaching Well, like in this webinar, all of the things that we teach you, you could bring to a student or a client. And we probably are bringing some of the tools we'll provide to a student or a client. But in the Teaching Well space, we get to talk about ourselves and we're getting to practice on ourselves and practice in relationship with our colleagues first. Knowing that when we have actually practice that and we embody it with other adults, we are much more likely to be able to pass that on to a student in a way that a student will live it because we will be modeling it and embodying it. And lastly, that we believe well-being is held at all levels of the system and we provide tools for each level. So we provide it both at the personal level, doing one-on-one -on -one work with educators and clients, at the interpersonal level, like you see, this is a concentric circle in the back of this PowerPoint slide as a way of having people practice communicating their needs or talking more about their identity. And three, at the systems level, what are the systems we put in place and how are they creating health or how are they creating harm and how are we transforming that? So we are right on time to do some tools. So where we're transitioning to next is um, both concepts and practice that allow us to take these beliefs that we shared and be able to put them into practice. Um, and one of the things that is really unique about the teaching well, or one of the things that we think is really important is how the literacy that we have on our own bodies to be able to acknowledge our stressors and understand the impacts of our identity or our interactions with others that we think that the body is incredibly intelligent and often can inform us of information that cerebrally um, we might not be able to get to just yet. So I'm gonna lead us through a body scan, body awareness meditation. And um, if you're comfortable and if you're able, um, so not if you're driving, but if you're able otherwise, I'd like you to comfortably come to a seated position. Um, maybe that's a lengthening of your spine and you go to the edge of your chair Maybe you really want to relax on your lunch break right now and you want to relax into the back of the chair. And maybe sitting's not comfortable and standing and swaying from side to side is going to be the thing for you. And when you're ready, I'm going to invite you to close your eyes and begin to notice the breath as it moves in and out of the nose or mouth. Each inhale lengthens the spine upward, and each exhale allows the body to relax, releasing tension at the corner of the eyes. Shoulders drop away from the ears. You can imagine even your ears relaxing, moving the tongue off the top of the mouth. Following the breath into the body, feeling the throat expand and contract with the breath. Feeling the chest rise and fall.
feeling the back side of the body participate with the breath, the shoulder blades moving, the rib cage rhythmically moving with the lungs. Feeling the belly rise and fall. Breathing so deep, it's as if you have a second set of lungs in the hips to the pelvic area, feeling the pressure rise on the inhale. And release on the exhale. Taking that sensitivity and awareness and traveling down the arms from the shoulders to the fingers. Traveling down the legs from the hips to the toes. And noticing the sensations of the body. can come in terms of tension, feeling places that are tight or loose. It can come in terms of density, places that feel really light, and other places that feel heavy. It can come in terms of color. Maybe it's just light and darkness. Maybe there's actual colors that are around different parts of the body, or the whole body. It can also come in terms of emotions. Just sitting with your thoughts and emotions and how they map to the body. Taking one more deep and even breath. Exhaling through the mouth. Beginning to wiggle the fingers and toes. Exhaling through the mouth again, reaching the arms overhead. Slowly stretching the body as if it's the first time today or the first time in a while. Keeping the eyes closed if you want that comfort. Staying in your own space. When you're ready, opening the eyes. So this is a tool that I use, that we use at the Teaching Well um, for all of our trainings. We create, start creating a communal conversation around what our bodies are saying and what meaning we make of it. So on the left-hand side of this power of this slide. You'll see a document that we um, that we offer to our to our educators and service providers, where they can map the sensations they had on the body on this bottom part, where they have the front and back side of an individual, and then they can also map what were the thoughts or emotions that were arising during their mindfulness practice. And one of the things we really want to emphasize is that um, there is a story that meditation or mindfulness brings, um, you know, it's like only peaceful and it brings you to this calm place on, you know, like you're on vacation. And what mindfulness and meditation do is they bring you fully to the present moment. And so for sometimes that brings up uncomfortable feelings or that brings up neutral feelings. And so you'll notice here that the emotions that we offer range from calm to jittery to uncomfortable to mindful, composed, confident. Um, and we also have three spots for people to be able to add in their own words. Um, and so we just are inviting people to start thinking and talking about their bodies and also to be able to start having conversations with their colleagues around what they are feeling in their body and what meaning are they making of it. Um, as you heard in how I shared, I have created kind of a lexicon of the ways that sensation comes through the body. Um, so temperature, weight, color, and tension are all different ways that we can feel that. Um, 
And by allowing people to start talking about it and normalizing that we all have sensations in the body and that those, sometimes, those oftentimes can inform us um, of stress that we're feeling or of a positive feeling um, and that the more literate we are and how our body feels and what it means to us means that we can be more connected and embodied with our colleagues and kids. I'm going to briefly, looking at the time, I'm going to briefly go over a couple um, pieces of science or and specifically brain and nervous system science that I use with educators and service providers. Um, these are both, I want to like give context that both of these are pretty elementary stories of the nervous system and the brain. Um, but what I have found is that they're really powerful tools in allowing people to normalize regulation in the body and dysregulation in the body. Um, so the first one is the hand brain model, which was created by McLean in 1990. And then Dr. Siegel has been really one of the main um, leaders in sharing about this work. So the brain model is a way to allow the hand to be a symbol for the brain, the wrist being the base, the brain stem that allows us to move our body and do the basics, heart pump, lungs breathe, digestive system work, um, flex muscles, right? And we don't have to think about any of that. Then the thumb inside of the brain is the limbic system. And that is the part of the brain. It's a collection of the hypothalamus, the amygdala, and the pituitary um, glands. And the three of those together are kind of what's identified as the reptilian part of our brain. So the part of our brain that allows us to survive in any given moment, and it is constantly scanning our environment for safety. Now, what has made us human, um, and although there are many animals that have evolved larger prefrontal cortex, like whales and elephants, um, but is our prefrontal cortex or our executive functioning part of the brain, which is the fingers folding over the thumb. And this is the part of us that um, builds society, creates agreements, allows us to be patient and delay gratification, um, and to empathize and understand someone else's experience even and especially if it's not our own. And one of the powerful tools about the hand brain model is that when we in our environment have decided something feels unsafe, whether that is a trigger from a past experience um, or is something that's happening in the present moment, our body and our brain will flip our lid and we will start leading and thinking with the part of our brain that's focused on survival. Um, this starts activating the sympathetic nervous system, which is our fight or flight system. And it is preparing the body. It dilates the eyes, brings um, blood to the arms and legs, preparing us to run, uh, stops our digestive system so that we can be re revved up and ready to go to um, make it through this big event. Um, and our brain was created that way to support us from getting away from predators. Um, but now as um, humans have evolved, we can activate that part of our nervous system, both in times where there is something unsafe in our environment and also to perform in an empowered way. Um, so like for this webinar, I noticed that I had for the last the five minutes before I started, I had to take a lot of deep breaths, get a lot of oxygen in. I felt my, my blood pumping through my hands, my hands were red and we're a little clammy. And that's an example of the sympathetic nervous system being revved up to get ready to facilitate this event for you. Now, what's really important is that our body is craving homeostasis. So at any given time when it is scanning the environment through all of our senses, the body is asking for a balance between getting us up and having that fight or flight response from the sympathetic nervous system and allowing the parasympathetic nervous system or the rest and digest system to allow the body to relax, digest, um, make children. And um, in balance, our body can mean, stay really healthy and allows us to feel connected, embodied, and connected to our executive functioning. If we get out of balance where we feel constantly that our sympathetic nervous system is turned on and that we are in a level of high stress, 
we can actually start depleting our ability to respond effectively to our environment. And so a way that we talk about this and we get out of the concept and we have kind of a visual mapping is called the human function curve. So the human function curve is a tool um, that was created by cardiologists, um, specifically Peter Nixon in the 1970s. The context is, is that stress as a term that we all use so colloquially at this point actually just meant the desire to act or perform. And it was the sense, it, even more baseline, it was a heart of the cardiology term that meant uh, the brain signal that told the heart to pump blood through the body. Okay. So in um, the 1970s, Peter Nixon created this human function curve. And the x-axis is the amount of stress signals um, that your brain is sending to your heart to act or perform or beat heart blood through the body. And the y-axis is performance, so your ability for your heart to pump that blood effectively through your system. He already knew that this was a metaphor. And in the 1970s, this paper where he produced this graphic, um, he called it a paradigm for our times. And so the teaching well, I initially used this with seventh graders as they prepared for their first integrated project um, and how they started kind of defining their stress. But this is really a mapping for a lot of service oriented people. Maybe you could identify it as connect the metaphors like we're heart centered and we're willing to do what it takes to be to to work for our clients. Um, but we think of the X axis as when we take that metaphor as a stress as stressors that come up in life um, in order for us to meet the needs of our clients and for our community and for ourselves personally. So if there's nothing to act or perform for, we don't have any performance at all. So that's really at the, where the X and Y axis meet. But as we increase the things that we want to act and perform for, we increase in effectiveness until we get to this place called the creative zone. And in the creative zone, we identify that as between 75 to 100% of your peak performance, where you have plan A, B, C, and G for each child. If your colleague doesn't make copies for you, like they said they would for a presentation, you're like, oh, no problem, I can make those copies. Um, if you get a parking ticket on your way home, you're like, ah, bummer. But you have room to take on that stressor and still continue to be in peak performance, right? So you continue to increase in your performance. This is also the place where we are creative and we generate new ideas. So this might be where you take on a new project for work or you try a different way of working with one of your clients that's different and new. And because it's different and new and because we're excited, we oftentimes take on more stressors, more desires to act or perform until we get to the apex or our peak performance. And at that point, um, our nervous system is going to start telling a different story. So thinking about those two, the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system, it's going to start saying you might be getting out of balance with all these things you want to act and perform for. Um, so I think about this as like, I'm like, ooh, I'm doing a really good job. Wow, I'm doing a lot. Am I going to keep doing a lot? Hmm. You know, like you start having that kind of question mark at the end of your sentences. People start looking at you and being like, wow, you're doing a lot. Are you okay? Like, yeah, I'm good. I'm good. Um, and if we don't listen to those cues, what will happen is our body will start telling us that we are past being peak performance and we move to what's called the fatigue zone. So the fatigue zone, you're still performing at the same level as you were in the creative zone or the apex, but it comes at a, at a cost. That cost could be that, you know, for me, I start cracking my knuckles um, or I get a, a little twinge in my neck that I kind of have to roll out because that's telling, you know, that's one of the ways my body talks to me. It could also be emotionally where, you know, your colleague doesn't make copies and instead of being like, oh, no worries, you know, I totally get that that happens sometimes you're like, oh, that like seems to happen a lot with you. <laughs> Um, or maybe you keep it really cool professionally, but then you go home to your partner and your partner hasn't taken out the trash or like didn't walk the dog. And you're like, well, I did all of these things. I wonder why you weren't able to walk the dog, right? So you start having a different tone and a different lens on 
even though you're performing really well, you start to see the world a little bit differently, a little bit more feeling like your energy, the amount of energy you're giving out is not matching the amount of energy giving, you're giving back and coming back. Now, the tools I'll provide you today and what we'll talk about and what we do with the teaching well is we have people identify their fatigue zone and begin to use tools to move left on the human function curve. Um, so for an example uh, for me today is I knew I had this big webinar, so I made sure to get up early this morning and I went on a really long hike. So I found that if I can go on for a hike at least for an hour, I can kind of forget time and I really reset my nervous system. So that was a way that I moved left from the fatigue zone back to the creative zone on the human function curve. Um, and these can be things that are an hour long hike or it could be something as fast as two minutes. Um, and it's something you have to do in between a meeting with a client and a meeting with your boss. Um, it could be in between, you know, picking kids up after lunch to um, picking up your kids when you, when you get off work and go home. Um, but we're constantly thinking about how do we come back and create a cycle of peak performance in the curve. Um, and so I'd love to just take 30 seconds and I'd like you to just map your own experience, maybe asking yourself, where are you today on the human function curve based on your current understanding? And is there an experience you've had when you were at some point in your life, maybe even today, where you didn't listen to those signals and then your body ended up having you do a full stop, like get sick over winter break or um, or needing to maybe getting pneumonia or finding a way where you have to fully stop in order to reset back to peak performance. And that would be an example of coming all the way over towards the burnout area, which so many of educators and I know a lot of service providers have experienced. So I want to encourage you that if you have any questions about the human function curve, please fill them out in the chat box or in the Q&A. Um, and this is a tool that we use. Now we have partners that are entering their fourth year working with us, and that this is a tool that we bring up and that they bring up in their own staff meetings to start talking about how people are feeling communally on campus. So we, you not only get to start making meaning of it today, but know that it's something that I've now worked with this tool for 10 years, and I still am learning new things about myself, learning new things about how this, um, how this framework works for both my organization, for the clients that we work with, um, and yeah, for me. So now that we know potentially where we are on the human function curve today, it's now an opportunity for us to think about how can we move left on the human function curve, reset the nervous system, and activate the parasympathetic nervous system? And the way that we talk about this is we have a mindful toolkit, and the tools are split into three categories. These categories came about because when I first started exploring mindfulness, um, trauma-informed practices, and yoga, it seemed like you really had to go on a retreat to the mountains to reset your nervous system. And as a teacher working from, you know, eight to five with hundreds of individuals, I knew that that wasn't possible for me. So these three tools are based on being a service provider with not a lot of time between clients or between students and um, knowing that I need to reset my nervous system to come and be prepared for the next activity or the next individual. So, Prepare tools are tools that I've collected from resources around you know, several organizations, many trainings that prepare people, educators for working with students who have experienced trauma, um, but prepare your nervous system for when you know you're going into a, a meeting, a classroom with a client that, uh, right, that oftentimes your nervous system may, be, may get dysregulated. 
So we'll share a prepare tool early later on today, but the body scan is a good example of a prepare tool where you just check in with your body and you allow your nervous system to set before you come and work with kids. This could happen right before class. Um, this could happen while you're in your car before you walk on to, into the building. Um, and it could be something as like doing a free write. It's a way for you to reset and prepare for the day. Interact tools are tools that you can use while you're working with a client or a student um, that they don't know you're doing, but you know you're doing to stay regulated um, as you're working with them so that they can have their experience and you can serve them most effectively. So um, an example of that would be uh, using the Hegu pressure point. So the Hegu pressure point is a, a Chinese acupressure point that's used to reduce migraines but it also activates the oxytocin and the dopamine in the body and the parasympathetic nervous system. So you can press here, it's right where those two bones meet. And then I just close my hand and during a staff meeting or during an IEP meeting, I'm pressing hard here just for a minute and taking deep breaths and I'm allowing my body to reset my nervous system while I'm still working with the group. Another example that works really well if you're working with larger groups of people is swaying. Um, the ears are full of water and it's actually closely connected to the vagus nerve, which is the big stress nerve um, that activates the sympathetic nervous system. And so by swaying, I'm allowing my body to start creating a rhythm of equilibrium in the ears um, and it allows my body to rest. This is a big um, strategy from Peter Levine. And lastly, tools to integrate. So if I have been in an environment with many dysregulated people for, um, for many reasons, it is vital as a healthcare provider to do my own emotional and physical digestion of the experiences that were surrounding me. Um, and so these integrate tools are ways that you can reset the nervous system after a big long work day so that you can come back and let that go. Um, an example that we have that just gives so much importance to this is that when I work with younger, people that work with young kids between the ages of three and really for right being born to like six, is that a kid will have a huge emotional experience and then that's gone, you know? And Oftentimes teachers will bring, in a, a kid will not bring that to school the next day, but a, a teacher will if they haven't done their work. So now they're looking at that student from the lens of that temper tantrum or that dysregulated experience they had the day before. And that kid is here fully present, fully ready to learn. Um, and so that's an example of why it's so vital for us to use our integration tools because it then allows us to show up for that student fresh and ready, just like that student showing up. So I usually give about 20 tools if we were doing a longer training or we were working together for long periods of time. But with only a few minutes left, I have two tools that I just want to name. Um, the first is I can't, all of these tools um, are really secondary to two things that you can do for your body. Uh, one, drink enough water. The water, water is 70% of our body and it is a huge mood regulator. So oftentimes when we think we're hungry, we're mo most of the time we're thirsty. Um, and when we're thirsty, we're more likely to our, for our nervous system to come into tension and dysregulation. Um, and then the second part is making sure that we're eating well and that we're using and moving our body. Our body has the tools to regulate itself if given water, food, and time to move it. So all of these tools um, and strategies are um, secondary to just the understanding that our body will regulate itself if we give it permission and we prioritize caring for it. The second tool and final tool that I'm going to be offering today is a tool that I've used with, um, with service providers um, to identify a ritual that they can add to their life. So a ritual is a prepare and integrate tool. It's a tool you can create a ritual before you enter your work environment or when you leave your work environment. It could be a ritual for when you step into an IEP meeting or when you step into a 
uh, assessment, um, a, 50, a 504 meeting, um, just to give a bunch of school acronyms. I apologize if that's not connecting. Um, but let me tell you the difference, and then I want to give you a minute to write your, a ritual that you already use, and then I'd love for you to put it in the chat box or a ritual you want to add. So I want to distinguish between a ritual and a routine. Um, a routine is about time efficiency and getting things done. It's not about activating the senses. It's task-oriented and time-focused. So it's like I have a routine to, um, to get my, um, let's see, to like transition from lunch to picking up kids or transition from uh, my staff meeting back to, back to students so that I can be more efficient with my time in between. That is routine. A ritual can be done with the same amount of time, but the focus is about creating a five sensory experience. So activating your visual cortex, your listening, your sense of touch, your sense of taste, um, bringing joy and peace so that you can get your needs met. It's focused on stress reduction and it's focused on the action you're doing rather than getting it done fast. So an example that of a ritual that a teacher had um, or and a teacher specifically for this one, is she'd sit in her car as she was leaving her school day and she'd say, the school day is done. I've done what I can. I'm grateful for the learning I had and grateful for the learning I gave. And I'm ready to go home and start my life at home. Um, so that was an example of a set of affirmations she did to make sure she can make the transition. For some people, it's just aromatherapy, like a moment with just smelling lavender. Um, it also could be taking five deep breaths before the workday starts, where you connect and feel your feet on the floor. That's oftentimes what I do before large meetings. Um, and it's a ritual just to connect back to my body and remind me of the being doing the work. Um, so if you want to take a few moments to maybe write in the chat box or the Q&A a ritual that you do that brings, that brings you to life, brings you back to connection. And we're going to transition to Q&A. Um, I want to just say that when we have worked with sites where we do one-on-one -on -one support for educators, <clears throat> whole staff PDs like this, where we change the narrative of what it means to be an educator to include personal well-being and healthy communication, um, we have seen a decrease in attrition by 50%. So over the course of the last three years, 77 more educators have stayed in the classroom because of our work. And we've saved school districts $1.3 million, which is very important for those who are running, financially running school districts. Um, we um, are not, um, while we are innovators in a field, we know that we are standing on the shoulders of many people who've come before. So we want to lift up at the end of this PD um, women and men who have been doing this work. So this slide's about people who are leading um, care provider focus thinking about trauma-informed practices, who are the leaders that support us in this work and who have given us context and clarity. And some more, with really focusing more on the somatic side of how to release trauma in the body by using the physical um, nervous system. And with that, I'm going to open the floor for questions. Thank you so much, Kelly. That was so helpful, and I actually um, so much more participatory than most webinars. I feel so calm after having done the body scan and some movement of my body as you talked. Um, thank you. That was lovely. Um, we um, got two great suggestions on how what rituals that people say, that people use in their daily work. Um, one is the idea of washing hands and pretending that they're washing all their stress down the drain. So I loved that one. I haven't heard that one before. Um, and then another ritual that someone said is that as they're leaving their office, they take in the space for a moment, breathe, and give thanks for all who visited their sacred space. Mm, beautiful. Yeah, great examples. 
Um, I know we're almost out of time. We have about three minutes left. If anyone else wants to share their rituals, we're happy to hear them. Um, I did want to name a few other resources. We will put this webinar as well as the resources within it onto our website so that you can go back and access those if you need to sort of remember sometimes it's hard you take in all this wonderful information and you want to use it in your daily life and then, you know, two weeks later you're like, wait, what did I learn from Kelly and how do I do that and what suggestions does she have? So that will be there. Um, and then also on CSHA's website we have a school climate resources page um, and in fact Lance McGee, who is joining us on the webinar, um, he was the one who uh, takes breath and gives thanks for all the people who visited the sacred space. We have a, a case study there about the work that he's doing supporting teachers um, at one of the schools in uh, East Oakland. So um, please check out that resource as well and use this to um, to take care of yourself and so that you can um, serve the young people that you're working with even more fully by serving yourself more fully. Um, in the last minute, I just want to open the space if anyone has any other rituals, suggestions, or questions. Kelsey, Kelly, is there anything else you want to leave us with? No, I'm really grateful for this time. I'm grateful that we get to have this conversation. So thank you so much, Amy, for allowing this to be possible. And, um, and yeah, we're blessed to be able to be of service and to be at a time where um, care for the provider is seen as an integral part of care for the for the collective. Absolutely. Thank you so much to Kelly, and thank you so much to all of you for joining us, um, where we look forward to working with you all more in the future, and hope to see you in May in Sacramento and um, back on more CSHA webinars. I believe the next three are focused primarily on substance use prevention and treatment, so if that's coming up for you in your work, by all means, check out our webinar calendar on our website. Thank you so much, and have a great rest of your afternoon. Have a good day. Bye.